Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's Professional Education Quickenar on COVID-19. My name is Matt McDonough. I will be your host for today's event, and on behalf of myself, the entire End Stage Renal Disease National Coordinating Center, NCMS, I do want to welcome you to this afternoon's event. Uh, before we do proceed to our next slides, uh, as always, we are recording this event, uh, and the recording and the slides for this event will be published on our NCC Quickenars page, usually within 48 hours or so. Uh, we tend to get them up usually next day, uh, but we ask that you give us till the end of the week to get these published. Uh, so after today's event, you can go out there and find those slides and recording uh, probably late tomorrow afternoon. So let's uh, move to our agenda. Um, we'll give you a brief overview here in just a moment about what this call is all about. Um, after that, I will introduce today's speaker. We have uh, Dr. Richard Perez with us, and you can see he's from uh, UC Davis. And his topic today will be making kidney transplantation possible during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, as Dr. Perez speaks to us today, uh, we do invite you, as always, to submit any questions that you may have for him or our team using the chat panel or the Q&A panel that is available from the WebEx uh, menu or on your right panels. Uh, you don't have to wait till the question and answer time comes. At any time, please feel free to submit questions via either of those platforms we are watching. And as time allows, we will go ahead and answer as many questions as we can before the end of our event. Um, and so again, uh, we appreciate you uh, asking any questions as they come to mind today. So let's talk a little bit about what this call is. Um, this is our opportunity to hear from stakeholders and our peers in the ESRD community who are continually still adapting to the changing COVID-19 situation. Um, as always, uh, they'll share examples and they'll provide real world strategies that uh, you can use uh, or transplant centers can use in their efforts to adapt and cope with COVID-19. Uh, and again, this is a weekly series of calls um, that engages on varying topics related to our COVID situation. Um, so at this point, I would like to take some time to introduce Dr. Richard V. Perez. He's the Chief of Transplant Surgery at UC Davis Health, and he's also the Director of the Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program. Uh, Dr. Perez is an experienced transplant surgeon, and his main interests are in kidney and pancreas transplantation and in hemodialysis vascular access. Now, Dr. Perez is also a well-respected educator in the field of organ transplantation. His research interests focus on the expansion of the pool of deceased organs that are available for renal transplantation and also the role of inflammation that contributes to transplant outcomes. It is my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Perez. Well, thank you. It's um, a pleasure to be with you uh, virtually here. Um, just a word about myself. I've been here at UC Davis uh, my whole career, so that's coming up on almost 30 years. So I've, we've seen a lot here, but I don't think we've seen anything quite like what we're experiencing now in this uh, pandemic. A couple of um, disclaimers I, I might say. I mean, the talk is about uh, making transplantation possible during, during the COVID pandemic. Sacramento, uh, which is where we're located, um, has not really uh, had the impact that we anticipated for the, you know, the pandemic. And early on, as everybody you know, nationwide was making preparations, we were prepared for uh, a tremendous surge of patients. And um, we did have a, a fair number, but not quite as, as, as many as a lot of other places. So just take that in context, um, you know, our experience over the last three months would be more typical of a, of a community that hasn't had a, a huge uh, surge of activity. On the other hand, uh, now that we are starting to see a, a surge of patients um, in our community and the infection rate is going up, the, the census in our hospital is going up. So we're continuing to uh, assess things as, as we go forward. And you know, my exper our experience over the last three months may need to be modified as we, as we see how this pandemic develops. So uh, next slide. 
just uh, uh, just a few words about how how we've been coping with this in general, and uh, what has been the perspective of of how we make decisions. We um, since a lot of this all of this really has been new to to us. We we've certainly tried to maintain communication amongst the team as a as a, a big priority. Um, We've had regular leadership meetings and faculty meetings uh, amongst the surgeons, nephrologists, and other um, uh, multidisciplinary care team. And uh, we discuss the issues, uh, and things cha are ch changing so quickly that we, we try to meet as frequently as possible. Uh, we, as others, have taken um, great interest on what's going on in other regions of the of the country, so we've regularly monitored the uh, monitored the updates on uh, the experiences of people in different localities, uh, changing practice patterns both regionally and nationally. And then um, we've had frequent uh, transplant center staff updates as frequently as and and since we're trying to maintain. Um, uh, Social distancing. Obviously, these meetings haven't been in person, but we've had weekly WebEx meetings um, where everybody signs on, and so we've had 80 to 100 people sometimes on these these weekly uh, updates. Uh, people would be given an opportunity to pass their questions to the leadership beforehand, and so we would have a. Uh, 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 usually an hour meeting where we would talk about how things were going in the community, in the hospital, and then we would communicate to um, uh, the staff, uh, you know, any kind of policy and practice changes. And so as we've tried to optimize um, care within our program, the, the, the factors that really governed our decisions were, were uh, the four things I've listed really was what is the infection doing in our community and regionally? Where are the hot spots? Uh, and what are the trends? And then we've been in close contact with our hospital administration uh, regarding uh, protocols, uh, you know, uh, restrictions in terms of, of uh, elective surgery, resources um, being reallocated, and plans there. And some of our decisions have been influenced by that. And then, as we've we've tried to to offer transplantation, um, we um, wanted to do it in the safest way that we could possibly uh, provide. And that's really been our overriding priority. Uh, and then, lastly, uh, of course. The, the well-being of our team and, and keeping infection free has been has been uh, an important aspect of this. Now, <clears throat> first, the, the the when I talk about these kinds of things, you, it's always helpful to talk about what your mission statement is and what uh, what are you really trying to do in your program. And we have spent time to to hone down. Uh, in simple form, what our mission statement is as a program, and, and put very brief, succinctly, our purpose is to provide or to make transplantation a successful reality in as many patients as possible. Uh, it's simple, but we really, uh, our profile is that uh, we try to do everything we can to utilize all the organs that we can to provide a successful outcome. And of course, the, the values that you bring to the table are excellence, um, compassion, innovation, and investigation. So those are the those are sort of what we would like to think as the important priorities in our program. And as such, we've been, uh, uh, I think, in, in some degree, uh, successful over the last decade as we have one of the busiest programs in the country in terms of deceased donor. Typically, um, our average over the last you know five to six years has been 300 plus or so kidneys per year. And so, as we go into this pandemic, 
you know, we have to adjust our expectations, but our vision and our mission is still the same. Next. Next slide, please. So here are kind of in a, I know I was limited to a few slides, so I tried to just summarize uh, what we've done here uh, over the last few months. So, of course, January, February, um, this was not really on the radar screen for most people. But in, so our transplant activity uh, on the left here is the number of transplants we did per month. Um, so in March is when we started to really take this uh, more seriously. And we had one of our regular meetings in the middle of the month. And we thought, uh, first of all, we need to do, we need to, to be safe. And, and when people talk about elective surgery, we, we consider the living donor procedures, elective operations. And so we halted all activity on our living donor program in mid-March. Um, for our deceased donor program, we became much more restrictive and we tried to limit um, uh, the, um, the acceptance of what we would call very high risk organs that would, that would subject uh, patients to long hospital stays uh, we stopped taking kidneys that we thought would be um, very slow to recover and might might cause a, a, a prolonged hospitalization. We also were very restrictive in terms of recipients. We didn't accept any recipients that had any cardio or respiratory problems. We limited transplants to recipients uh, over uh, did not take any over the age of 70 during that early time. Uh, we also thought that in order to do this safely, we insisted on getting a COVID-19 test uh, preoperatively on, on the donors, deceased donors, and on uh, our recipients as they came in. And back then, testing was, was, uh, was not as consistent. It was difficult. The, the turnaround time was longer, but so that made, made it more difficult. But we thought that that was something we had to do to offer it safely. Uh, and then in our outpatient um, clinic, we put on very significant restrictions, trying to limit all in-person visits. We stopped all of our new evaluations and our re-evaluations and then limited it to just seeing fresh transplant patients or patients that had new problems. As we were able to, you know, we did um, continue to do transplants, as you can see uh, from the bar there, we did 20 or so. Uh, deceased donors that month in April, the, the, our number dipped a little bit, but we became more um, familiar with how things were, were going. We, we actually, in April, changed our immunosuppression based on a lot of what people were saying, trying to limit the amount of uh, severe um, leukopenia or lymph lymphopenia. So we, we modified our immunosuppression and, and decreased the amount of anti-lymphocyte globulin that we used in our induction protocol. As we became more comfortable and testing became um, uh, more accessible, we now have a rapid two-hour turnaround test that we can do at any time. And so we began um, loosening things in May, and we uh, started restricting uh, we lifted the restrictions in our deceased donor program uh, in May. Uh, in general, uh, we restarted our living our, our living donor program, and our numbers started increasing. And then in June, uh, kind of our new normal, we um, we began. Uh, uh, we didn't. Uh, we we were willing to take patients that. Um, we're from some of these hotspots, and uh, we continued to see an increase in numbers. And, and uh, so our, our number in June and subsequently in July seemed like we're going to be back to our traditional sort of pace of, of transplants. Next. So specifically, what did we do? Um, I think I've, I mentioned on that, and when we first encountered this um, phenomena, we put our living donor program on hold. We restricted deceased donors. Um, we um, we utilized the outpatient um, um, uh, telemedicine um, modality, 
And then we began to really uh, take social distancing measures within the clinic uh, for patients and personnel. And then we, we thought, how do we best um, uh, communicate all this to our patients? And we made an effort to make all of the, the decisions and policies available on our website. So as we had all patients calling in, we just directed them to our website, our website um, where we tried to, to update our, um, uh, our activity, our expectations, and then we also created links there for patient education materials. Next. Some of the, uh, some of the more practical things in terms of running the program, um, we ended up having to uh, uh, admit patients much earlier than we thought, uh, than we uh, initially had done in the past because of the, the, the need to do the COVID testing. Early on, it was a six hour turnaround. And so that meant sometimes bringing these patients in to, uh, to just for the testing and everything would be done and we'd be waiting for the COVID test before we took them to the OR. Because of the, um, the, that prolonged period of time, we ended up utilizing um, a hypothermic machine perfusions. So we'd put these kidneys on pump um, because it would buy us some extra time to, to, um, uh, to find a patient, to make sure they were okay, to do the, the, the COVID testing. Now, because of all of that and because of the longer cold times, we expected that sometimes we'd have a low, slower recovery of the kidneys, and we, we did see more DGF, and our hospital stays actually did increase for, for uh, that short period of time. And then, as I had mentioned before, because we were concerned about potentially sending these patients out into the community, uh, we changed our immunosuppressant suppression protocol uh, by decreasing the amount of anti-lymphocyte antibody thymoglobulin by 50%. In order, for to make, in order to make up for that, we uh, put them on a steroid taper, 30-day steroid taper. Traditionally, our patients don't receive any steroids post-transplant, so that was how we accommodated that. And then because we had to monitor the, uh, we wanted to monitor the tacrolimus levels a little more closely, we made a change from on the slow release um, uh, tacrolimus, which is which takes longer to get steady state, to the more immediate release, the traditional uh, tacrolimus tablets that um, that we can monitor more frequently. So those are kind of some of the the practical things that we did within our program. Next. So our new normal now um, that we are currently um, feeling more comfortable is um, we we've no longer um, uh, we don't long, we don't have the the restrictions in terms of the higher risk uh, deceased donors. We're traditionally a program that imports a lot of kidneys from outside OPOs uh, because we we feel comfortable working with them and looking at them, assessing them, putting them on the pump, and we're continuing. We're going back to that. Uh, we've lifted the age restrictions, so we're, we're transplanting patients um, in their 60s and 70s again. Um, of course, uh, this is all with, um, uh, with the patient being educated, and that's part of what we've done is we, we now have a, uh, we make sure that the patient is, uh, aware of, of the, the need for personal hygiene and social distancing and the potential for higher risk, um, uh, risk ex infection exposure both in the hospital and in the community, and they need to be comfortable with that. So during this time, we have had patients that have turned down uh, kidneys because they just feel like it's not really the right time for them. And we certainly respected that. We, we have a script that we read to them telling them that if they are not comfortable, they can pass up on organs and they would not lose their place in line, uh, so to speak. And we could revisit this whole uh, scenario with them in, in a few months. Um, so I mentioned uh, our immunosuppression. We've gone back to our standard uh, immunosuppression regimen now. Uh, we have restarted our living donor program. 
although we are cautious with those living donors that are from hotspots. We have had actually one living donor that has tested positive during the pre-op period, and uh, so we've had to cancel that, and, and we have now incorporated what's been recommended by uh, the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, and that is to test the donor on at least two, possibly three occasions prior to donation, including one rapid uh, rapid test the day uh, the day of surgery. So our our living donor is um, uh, program is is back and going again. And so I think that is that my last slide. That is, and yeah. um, we do have some questions that have been trickling in. Um, so uh, let me just let me just summarize it too, then, um, because as I said, uh, there um, things are changing in our community, and we may have to what we're doing now may have to change, and I suspect it will, as we see more and more um, more and more infections in the community. We've been fortunate in that during the early part of this pandemic, we only had one positive uh, recipient that uh, was about three years post-transplant and, and tested positive, had a mild year, uh, upper respiratory uh, infection and did well. But uh, over the last month, we have started to see a few more. We've had five or six now total, including one patient that actually uh, expired um, that was you know, about three or four years post-transplant. Fortunately, we've had no fresh transplant patients that have had infections. But uh, we're, you know, following things uh, very closely and certainly trying to be flexible to make changes. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Certainly. And uh, as I said, we've got a few in. Um, and I'll take this opportunity to invite anyone who has a question to uh, submit it at this time. A uh, question just came in that said, uh, th this person asks, patients have asked me if kidneys from people who are passing away due to COVID, are, are they viable for transplant use? As far as I know, um, nobody is, uh, is, is transplanting patients uh, with COVID positive with, with kidneys from COVID positive uh, donors. Mm -hmm. the, the theoretical um, concern is that the virus could be passed um, hematogenously because in some of the early literature from China, uh, I think it was 15% of the patients that were admitted with acute respiratory problems had COVID uh, in their blood. So that's a concern. So um, it's possible that they could be done safely, but I don't believe anybody is doing it now. We're certainly not doing it. But uh, I mean, it's it could be analogous to influenza, where uh, you know people are hospitalized with respiratory failure from, from the flu, and those organs are still transplantable. But COVID, we just don't know enough now. Certainly, that makes sense. Um, another question came in, um, and, and this person says, I'm sure that you've experienced potential recipients and donors having fears of getting transplanted. And I think you mentioned you had one opt out of a transplant uh, because of those concerns. Um, what specifically did you do to ease those elevated fears of, of both donors and recipients to assure them that this was going to be a safe environment for this surgery to occur? Yeah, we've had. Uh, I'm I'm sorry to 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 maybe have misled some people. We've had more than one. We've had a number of patients that uh, that have opted out um, because they just don't feel comfortable, and we totally respect that. What we what we tell patients is essentially that we are doing everything within our power to provide this in the safest possible environment. So we're, we're monitoring the, uh, we're, we're looking at the donors and we're only transplanting um, kidneys or accepting kidneys from donors that have been tested and are negative for COVID. And then as I mentioned, we are, um, we are uh, 
uh, testing all the recipients with, uh, with a nasal swab on admission and will not proceed to the operating room unless they are negative. And then in the hospital, we're we're uh, we're confident that they're not going to get it in the hospital because we're very um, we're very strict in terms of PPE and social distancing and everything uh, on the transplant floor. Uh, so uh, we try everything we can, but they have to agree to take responsibility themselves. Uh, in terms of their personal hygiene and social distancing. And, you know, one of the problems is that um, for some patients that may not be possible. I mean, if they're, they, they don't have that ability to do that, um, then, you know, they're dependent on, you know, public transportation and, and yep. uh, those types of things, then we we tell them that maybe it's not the best time for you, and and uh, and that's one of the difficulties during this during this pandemic as well. I didn't mention, but we've had to we've had to um, address um, patients and and reassess. Um, issues that may have been affected by the pandemic, including their financial financial state. A lot of patients now are between jobs, and they may have had change in insurance or just uh, less less income in general. So that's a hardship that we that we address, and the social psychosocial support as well. Um, though there is a lot of stress going on, as we know, in different households. So it's um, it's something that we have we have uh, tried to to really discuss with the patients as we we talk about moving forward. Right. I think we have time for one more question, uh, and this one is, this is actually a, I'm curious about this one. Um, you've noticed, um, or you mentioned, I should say, that um, you know. You've seen a second wave, so to speak, start to um, you know creep back in, and we have down south as well. Um, with that second wave and the concern of patients, uh, I noticed your your living donors and your deceased donors were rising at a you know fairly consistent rate from April to June. Um, are people less concerned about receiving a living donor from someone they know versus the deceased donor, or is the, the concern about the surgery just kind of there? Uh, um, I think most people in general are less concerned about the living donor just because they know, you know, they know much more about mm-hmm. about what's going on and and uh, and there's the ability to do the testing uh, right to the to the point of of uh, donation. Uh, so. Uh, I th- I think that's been true. The pandemic, I think, is not it's no different during the pandemic. But I think in general, people are a little more have a little bit less anxiety related to that. The re- the anxieties, though, I think, are different. And obviously, there's more of a stress in terms of having their donor exposed to potential problems during COVID. Um, so it's a it's a different dynamic. Um, but um, we're we're you know we we feel like the living donor situation is needs special consideration, and so we're we're much more uh, willing to um, uh, to be restrictive and to be ultra conservative when it when, with regards to our living donors. And you'll see some variation within the the field about that. Some places have not really cut back on living donation to the same degree as other places, and we're probably kind of in the middle. Um, But our program has, you know, I I would like it to be more living donor focused, but our program has, through history and through just the way we've grown, we've been more deceased donor um, focused uh, because that's, and the opportunity for us to expand, we're utilizing 
a lot of kidneys that other people don't feel comfortable with, like the do a lot more pediatric on blocks, or really the small pediatric donors. And so, uh, I don't know if I answered the question. No, uh, I think that you did, sir. I, I appreciate that. Um, well, we are at the bottom of the hour, and um, I, I, I know we've we've kind of gone a little bit over our time, but I wanted to take this opportunity and say thank you for being with us. Um, I, certainly, you're doing some great things out there, and, and with this dynamic changing situation, uh, we appreciate you being here and sharing uh, what's been working for you uh, out at UC Davis. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll move into our wrap up. Uh, before we do, let's talk a little bit about the kidneyhub.org, mobile friendly web tool for patients and professionals. Uh, it was developed in conjunction with our patient subject matter experts uh, and the ESRD NCC. Uh, and of course, the important resources that are out there COVID 19, patient education, uh, the patient grant library has been something that's been getting a lot of uh, uh, attention out there, as well as the, uh, the videos on increased risk kidneys and more. So uh, if you haven't been out there yet, please take a visit, bookmark it to your device's home screen, and let us know what you like and what you'd like to see. Our next COVID-19 Quickenar events, uh, our next patient-focused event will be next Tuesday evening, that's July 28th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time and our next provider-focused event one week from tonight at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, those events uh, either are or will be available for registration at www.kidneycovidinfocenter.com. Uh, so we invite you to go out there. Uh, that is also where the recording and the slides from today's presentation uh, and, and uh, Dr. Perez's uh, slides and session will be published out there uh, by end of business tomorrow as well. So please take a visit to www.kidneycovidinfocenter.com. And that'll bring us to the conclusion of our, our event. I want to say thank you on behalf of the entire ESRD NCC. And again, a special thanks to Dr. Perez for being here today. Uh, we do have some additional COVID-19 resources available for you to visit. You can see the websites on the page. Uh, and uh, more than anything, we hope that you will uh, come back and see us for another uh, COVID-19 Quickenar event uh, next week. So thank you for your time this afternoon. Have a wonderful evening.